Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. <clears throat> I was here about a year ago, I think, and um, it's a beautiful church and a beautiful congregation, and I appreciate being back here again. Our next scripture, which you can find in, on page um, 939, but it's very short, is in 2 Corinthians, and it's um, in 5, 1, and 2. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. You can see that the word longing has been said a lot already this morning. So let me see whether we can figure out what it means. Just got to put this down. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> you, you probably know what the word longing means. I'm not saying you don't know what it means. But do you know what spiritual longing means? Now, even if you feel pretty confident you know, it's really not that simple. Spiritual longing is not that simple. It's not the same as wanting or needing or even desiring. No, these aren't, these aren't bad feelings. We all need and want many, many things. But even when we get what we want or need, so, sometimes we're not, still not satisfied. In fact, most of the time we're still not satisfied because then we go on looking for more things that we want or need but some kind of longing still remains. So you might have gotten the new house, the new car, but you still feel something is missing. Now, unfortunately, we often block that longing. But why? Why would we? I mean, it sounds important, like we need to fulfill it, right? Well, many of us are pessimistic that this deep yearning could even be fulfilled. Some are convinced good, is, good enough is good enough, let's leave good enough alone. And actually, most of us are afraid to get out of our comfort zone. That's what really is at the bottom of this. We're afraid to hope for more because we're afraid we'll find out that there is no more. It seems safer to stay where we are. But actually, and I'm sure you know this, spiritual longing is not about having more things, more people, more stuff in our lives. It's not about making our lives better through better income, better relationships better friends, better children. These things aren't bad in themselves. But we can, in our desperation to have something to aim for, obsess over them and end up making them false gods. Now, our culture is really good at picking up on this. Advertisements in general and other, and even shows, play upon this feeling. So they short circuit our legitimate longing and try to fill it instead with things or promises. You know, like if we could only have a fitter body, then we would be satisfied. If we, we could only have a bit of fame, then we would matter. If we drove a really nice car, people would admire us as we drove by. These are things that we're told. Like if we could only have the right insurance policy, then we would feel secure. If only we could do a better job of saving for retirement, then we would feel safer growing older. But you know, when you, when you do these things or get these things, the satisfactions only last a short time because you know deep in your heart that these things really, at bottom, don't bring lasting peace or satisfaction. But how do we go down a different path? We still have the needs and the wants, but how do we go on a path that will help satisfy this hidden longing? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Brother Stendhal Rast, He's a monk, and he's in his 90s already, but he survived the Nazis, and he's European, he survived the Nazis and other traumatic events. So over his life, through careful observation, here's what he offers. Quote, if we encourage people to be more alive, to find their area of enthusiasm, and feed that area, then they may gain in vitality, and then be able to take in stride the pain and suffering that's just part of life. Another uh, thinker, the Reverend Howard Thurman, offers a similar observation. He says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. Then go and do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Now, both of these thinkers 
know that God is the source of this aliveness. But how do you recognize your place of aliveness? Because each of us is so different. Um, think about this. When do you feel a sudden upsurge of joy? When do you feel you're in the right place at the right time? When do you feel a sudden rush of wonder and surprise? I think children have some of these feelings. They're more accessible to children, but it doesn't matter your age. This is true for all of us. We all have places where we feel more alive. Now, for me, it was always the ocean. Even when I wasn't a religious person, because I wasn't raised religious, I felt something at the ocean. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it made my heart sing. It just made me feel hope in something I couldn't put my finger on. Well, as a ch when I played in the waves as a child, I'm a Jersey girl, by the way, I'm a Buckeye now, but I'm from New Jersey. So when I played in the waves, I felt somehow connected to something I didn't know. So I, it was still there as I grew up. So when I grew up, I went on a long journey trying to figure out what I was looking for. And there's a lot of people out there now, oftentimes people that call themselves spiritual but not religious, they're on that same journey. So I tried so many things. I tried spiritual alternatives that didn't satisfy, they were interesting, but they didn't really answer my essentially theological questions about the meaning of life, my purpose in it, about life and death. You know, that's why I think I became a theologian, because those were the real essential questions. Well, I finally found that resting place and that place where I came alive when some loving Christian people helped me turn towards God. And then it was so different, so life-changing, that I wanted to help others experience God too. So I came alive and found my joy and my place in teaching, preaching, and just really deeply listening to others. But your place may be something different. Well, here's another example. Do you know, do you know the story of St. Francis of Assisi? St. Francis? Um, well, Francis was born rich and a playboy. His father sold expensive fabrics, and he, they did very, very well. Francis had everything he needed and more. Besides being a playboy, he thought it would be great to be a warrior, so he joined other young men in fighting Perugia. That was the next village over. There was a lot of that going on then in the Middle Ages. Well, it didn't actually didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, did not go well for Francis. He was injured. He was caught, and he was imprisoned. He had time there, though, to think about his life. He realized all the things he had been taught to value and going after didn't work for him. Well, eventually he was lucky and he got released and he sent, was sent back to Assisi, but he was a changed person when he got there. Um, it, it, the Italian city of Assisi, the home of St. Francis, has a wonderful basilica, a fresco in the basilica which illustrates that. A few years ago, Joe, my husband, and I went there, and we did all the tourist things. It, we, it was wonderful and beautiful. Like We visited churches, museums. We went to different restaurants. Um, I have an Italian background, so I was, felt very good there. But I knew we couldn't stay in Assisi forever, and I didn't, I'm sure I wasn't able to hold on to these good feelings. It wasn't a permanent satisfaction, as good as it was. But something stopped me in my tracks. We were visiting this basilica, and... Um, there were frescoes all over the walls illustrating scenes in his life. Now, I was looking at them, you know, and enjoying it, but I was especially struck by this one very large fresco. It captured my imagination, and I stayed there a long time looking at it. Joe probably wondered why I was standing there for so long. Usually you just look and you keep moving on if you're a tourist. Well, here's what I saw. The, in the fresco, you see his father on one side with some townspeople behind him. He's looking very upset, very dismayed. Now, of course, the father thought Francis would take over the business, right? That's always what happened. But in the fresco, which you have to see, you should look, Google it on your phone, you see Francis has taken off all his expensive clothes, everything. And he's given them back to his father. His father has the clothes on his arm. And Francis is instead naked, pointing up to heaven. Now, he isn't just standing there naked because a, uh, a bishop rushes over and puts his cloak around uh, Francis's lower half. And, um, you know, it's, it just really struck me. But the meaning I got from the fresco is this. Francis realized that wealth just wasn't going to do it for him. His finger pointing to the sky means he is redirecting his sight towards God rather than being a rich playboy or a warrior. And the cloak, I think is the church agreeing to shelter Francis 
in what became his amazing ministry of gathering other young people to follow God instead of all the other distractions that they had been given in that period. The fresco made me feel alive. It told me that the path I was on and the work I had chosen was right for me and was from God. But what about you? Now that, now that you have the spiritual longing in your heart, now that you recognize it, but maybe are afraid to acknowledge it for too long or afraid to explore it, you know now, I hope, that that's really a longing for God, just like the Bible says. And in this life, on this earth, it's a longing that can be somewhat satisfied when we feel fully alive. Because when you're in that place of feeling fully alive, you are with God, and God is with you. Here's another story that may resonate with some people that are like rock, fans of rock music. Okay, Father Bob Warren, who ministers at the Graymore Retreat Center, tells the story of Alice Cooper. Has anyone here heard of Alice Cooper? Okay. All right. He, was, he is an outrageous entertainer. He became famous in the late 1960s, and he continues. He's still out there. He's, he's known as the godfather of shock, rock, right? Cooper draws from horror films to do things just to shock the audience. He sets fires, he uses electric chairs, guillotines, live snakes, all that kind of stuff. Well, here's what Father Bob says about this. He said that Alice Cooper glorified rebellion, immorality, idolatry, and excess. So can you imagine how surprised people were when Alice Cooper converted to Christianity in 1995? Did you know that happened? Here's what Alice Cooper said about himself. He said, like Jesus, it sounds like Francis too. He said, like Jesus, I went to the desert and I learned to regret all those false gods. He is now involved in a church in Arizona and he even sings in the choir. And the guy got very involved. And here's what another thing he said, Father uh, Bob Warren said. He said, some time ago, someone sent Alice Cooper an email saying he had sold out. He did not have to join a church. This person said he didn't have to become part of the establishment, right? So Cooper replied with a poem. This is it. I wish you deeper and deeper oneness with God. I pray that you will feel it, that the presence of Christ will make your spirit sing, your bones quake, your blood to run thin, your very pulse to create a din. Aware that heaven is not up, but heaven is within. So... How do we reach this heaven within? <clears throat> this place of peace and joy and full aliveness, <clears throat> excuse me, where God is at the center of your life? Now, ironically, it's not about staying inside of yourself. You can meditate in things, but that's not the final solution at all. I really want to stress that. Because it's about not staying just inside of yourself, but going outside of yourself. Mother Teresa, who we heard earlier, <clears throat> sorry, has given us some ideas of what to do. So I urge you to go back and reread it because what she says is an idea of how we tear ourselves away from the pointless paths that don't lead anywhere. We're so distracted these days. We're almost, we almost don't take the time to listen to the still small voice that's God's because the pointless paths that we keep running down, they don't lead anywhere. But instead, we need to go down paths that will help us become fully alive and fully in touch with God. The Bible doesn't leave us without suggestions. It, it gives us a good path to walk on, a path that will always lead us in ways to become fully alive and fully in line with God. And it's very simple. It says we need to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Now, these pieces of advice will lead us out of our comfort zone. They will. But they will also lure us away from unsatisfying distractions, and they will show up our minor obsessions to be the false gods that they really are. Okay, so today, when you leave here, I would like you to remember just two sentences. One is from Reverend Thurman, and he says, Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and then go do it. You're going to have to think on that. And then for some clear directions, remember just these 10 words from the Bible. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Amen. Please join us for hymn 470.